for coming today to hear us speak. It means so much. Um, as Juliet said, my name is Rachel Zorik. I'm majoring in English and dance here. So it should come as no surprise that my research is combining my two fields of study together via rhythm, tap, and deep poetry, which are both major interests of mine I love. Now, I began rhythm tap dancing when I was five years old. And I first started reading and listening to beat poetry when I was a sophomore in high school. And what this allowed me was a really integral gap of time to develop an ear for the rhythmic complexities present in rhythm tap that I therefore was able to see in beat poetry as well, making you question how and why this was possible. But because I understand not everyone here has the same history with rhythm tap and beat poetry as I do, and also in order to provide content to analyze how these are so musically similar in the first place, I wanted to begin with an example of each. So, um, firstly, here's a video of rhythm tap dancing um, performed by Savian Glover. <laughs> I'm with you in Rockland, where we wake up electrified out of the coma by our own souls, airplanes roaring over the roof. They've come to drop angelic bombs. The hospital illuminates itself. Imaginary walls collapse. Oh, skinny legions run outside. Oh, star east-spangled shock of mercy. The eternal war is here. Oh, victory, forget your underwear, we're free, I'm with you. Now, these two clips have three main musical similarities between the two of them. The first of which is momentum, or the carrying of a repetition of sound over a bar of music, giving the listener the sense of being propelled across that bar of music. Now, Allen Ginsberg accomplishes this through a very specific poetic form of sonic repetition, which is alliteration or repetition of sound at the beginning of a word. Now there aren't any musical bars in poetry, but there are line breaks which function in the exact same way. So what Allen Ginsberg does is he writes streams of alliteration across line breaks to produce the sense of momentum. And this is seen on the third line of Howells in which he writes, the hospital illuminates itself, imaginary walls, which is that I alliteration carried over the line break, and therefore we as readers are carried through that line break at an increased pace. Um, this is also produced in Saving Glover's Tap Dancing by his repetition of five heel drops, all done as evenly accented quarter notes. Now, by definition, only four quarter notes can fit in a bar of music. So, um, what Saving Glover does by accenting those heel drops the same, exact same way, he carries us through that bar of music that he taps through as well. Henceforth, also creates momentum. These heel drops are another example of the next form of musical similarity between these two clips, which is uneven accenting. Now, even though the heel drops are accented evenly in respect to one another, the phrase that um, Sabine Glover performs before those heel drops are all done in 16th note phrases. So, therefore, he shows his own ability to syncopate his tap dancing in various ways. This is also accomplished in how, through Allen Ginsberg's different elongations or contractions of the words he speaks. For example, in the first line of how, every word is emphasized in a very equal way. But as we get um, further down into the passage with these O's that are really elongated, and then the phrases after them, which are kind of tripped through more quickly, we can see how he unevenly accents the words he speaks. Finally, the third musical similarity between these two clips is breath. And breath is originally a musical term describing a pause a musician would take after blowing into a horn instrument. And that pause actually really dictated the structure of how. <coughs> Allen Ginsberg wanted every line break in how to describe and embody his own breath. 
stuff, so where he envisioned himself taking a breath. And this also is very apparent in rhythm tap, in saving lovers stuff as well. Even though in tap, you tend to be able to tap longer than you can speak in one breath, just because you are using your feet instead of your mouth to tap dance, um, the same effect musically happens whenever Sabine Weber stops tap dancing or takes a break. That same pause creates a jarring of musical connection that makes his breath very apparent as well as a tap dancer. Now because these two clips have such similar musical qualities, I assume that they both came from the same inspirational source. But Rhythm Tap and Beat Poetry both were inspired by the same form of music. And because this form of music also had uneven accenting breath and momentum, I assume that it was bebop jazz that was pushing music. And just to give you a sense of what I mean by having um, all of these musical elements as well, here's a clip of Moaning by Charles <laughs> decreased in popularity when bebop increased in popularity. And not only was that that true, but also rhythm tap was done to a predominantly opposing form of jazz music, the bebop, which is swing music. And before I explain why this opposition occurred, I just want to play a little clip of Sing 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 by Benny Goodman so you could all hear what I say as I say. <laughs> underlying structure of jazz music as a whole. Now, all subgenres of jazz have the same foundational building blocks, which are the infrastructure and the superstructure. The infrastructure describes the steady pulsations in 2-4 or 4-4 time that occur throughout the entirety of the song. And the superstructure are all the notes that occur atop of that. And the way in which these layers of notes interact create the musical elements of momentum, uneven accenting, and breath I described previously. Now, swing has a really apparent infrastructure, something a lot of people can naturally tap their toes to and attach to quickly. And this actually is where the dissonance between swing and bebop is founded upon, because a lot of black swing jazz musicians thought that their cultural roots of jazz were being lost in this very very apparent infrastructure. Because jazz music was rooted in African polyrhythms, which were really complex, which swing music began with, but started to lose as it was popularized in America and became increasingly whitewashed. So as a means of reclaiming jazz music as something that belongs to the black community of America, black swing musicians actually started to create a new form of jazz music that had more complex superstructures and had an implied infrastructure as well. So they could just focus on having really complex superstructures and having the freedom that came from that. And as a result, bebop was born. And this actually connects bebop jazz to tap in a very real way because rhythm tap actually also had a preceding form of tap called class act tap that also oppressed the African-American members of tap dance based on an infrastructure. Now, class act tap dancers were expected to dance on their toes very lightly and exactly to the infrastructure of the music that was given because they had to prove their ability to be classy and perform in front of white audiences. So as a means of rebellion against this concept, rhythm tap dancers started to 
really unevenly accent their movements and use a lot of heel drops to accomplish this freedom away from that concept. So as a result, we actually can see that rhythm tap tends to have the same exact superstructure and rhythmic complexities of bebop jazz, and therefore, rhythm tap in a very real way, despite happening earlier, really anticipates these rhythms of bebop jazz. And this becomes very essential in linking rhythm tap to beat poetry, because beat poetry actually mindfully emulated bebop jazz's input, or superstructure freedom. Because just like the bebop musicians that were playing music at the same time, beat poets wanted a freedom from infrastructure. But this infrastructure to them, poetically, was fixed form. And this was because beat poets craved truth in their work, and they wanted to find a way to adequately find and express that truth. And fixed form was all written in very fixed rhyme and meter, which wasn't actually how people spoke in real life. So therefore, beat poets clung to bebop as this form of inspiration, because they saw bebop jazz as this musical version of the linguistic genuinity they were trying to achieve. And therefore, because the poets emulated bebop jazz, and rhythm tap dancers anticipated bebop jazz's superstructures, this transgression of rhythmic complexity is thus set up, in which I can very much say that rhythm tap also anticipated the rhythmic complexities of beat poetry. And this is really astounding because despite a slight overlap historically, Rhythm Tap and Beat Poets never actually met. They were never in the same room together. They never had any artistic discourse. Yet they were still able to produce the same rhythmic complexity just because they had bebop bridging them. And this really speaks to the power that art has in producing other art. And the power that art has in influencing itself cross interdisciplinarily to create these really large, structural trends in art as a whole that weren't even meant to happen in the first place. Thank you so much for listening. I believe we have some time for questions. Because a uh, um, fixed form was actually um, something that artistically um, represented the um, the concept of the ideal um, society that during the time of the beat poets actively oppressed homosexuality. So that was another reason why they were so against fixed form because they felt like it represented this concept of structure that they were being oppressed by in greater society. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, really, okay, my love for tap also goes into something deeper than just the rhythm. I've always loved tap because there's this concept in other forms of um, dance that relies very heavily on like the visual image of what a dancer is and should look like. And I've always loved tap because to me you can close your eyes and tap is tap. So it really decreases that need for dancers to fit this ideal body image. So that to me was like a really big reason I love tap. And to me, beat poetry 
I just loved it because it was so, it seemed so random when I first was introduced to it. I didn't understand it at all. And I love the concept of like getting away from structure because I've always been a very like creative person and my parents are both civil engineers. But to me, the poetry was this really cool way of being like, you know, you can really create something fascinating and exciting without needing the same structures. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was listening to that clip of Howl that I showed you guys, and I actually, um, I was taking Juliet's Dance 250 course, and we were doing a um, tap unit, a little, um, yeah, a little two days on the history of tap. And I had a clip of a tap dance also, like, on my YouTube um, tab, like, next door. So I was like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I, like, play them at the same time. So that was actually like the real root of that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, wait. And then I thought about my childhood and I was like, wait, this all, this all connects. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rachel.